What is up, nerds and nerdettes? Welcome back to the episode of The Pull. I'm your host, AJ Kunze. So at the end of last week's episode, I promised to take one shot for every new subscriber we got. And from the time I filmed that last episode to the filming of this episode, we have gained four subscribers! So that means four shots. Now I am... Um, normally drink Knob Creek, but you don't take shots in Knob Creek. That's, that's wasting your knob right there. Uh, so we're going to be drinking... A, you know what, you don't worry about what brand this is. Just know it's liquid gut rot brandy. It's like 13 bucks. That can say very good nice things about this liquor, so I don't think the company that makes it wants me talking about it on the internet. So here we go. <coughs> that is, oh, it's abusive, it's awful. <sighs> Tastes like licorice mixed with nail polish. <clears throat> <laughs> oh, it tastes like cherries mixed with pre prescription. It tastes like cherries mixed with prescription. T oh god, I can't even get my joke out. <clears throat> it tastes like cherries mixed with prescription. Fuck me, it's still burning. It tastes like cherries mixed with prescription strength toothpaste. Uh, it tastes like room temperature coffee mixed with cough drops. <clears throat> I really don't want to. Oh, this was such a bad idea. To episode number 22. <clears throat> uh, uh, tastes like drinking a punch in the dick. All right, let's get this episode out before I vomit and die. Okay, so a little bit ago, I was contacted by a representative of Hound Comics. They're a small comic book publisher out in New York, and they were nice enough to send me some free comic books to review. Free comic books? Fuck yeah, I'm on board. So they sent me a whole mess of comic books. So I'm mixing them in here and there, episode at a time, and the first one we're going to review is Brimstone and the Border Hound. Having said all that, I understand that it's uh, difficult to begin any sort of work of fiction, especially one that's based on an entirely novel world. It can be difficult to tell where exactly to start. But a note to Brimstone and the Border Hounds, this is not how you start a comic book. A 400 word dissertation and all the crazy made up bullshit you did is not an engaging way to start a comic book. And it's complete with a legend and footnotes and it buttresses up on being required course reading. It's just up below TPS reports or, or baseball box scores or Magna Carta. You're writing a comic book, dude, not the book of Job. When we get to the actual comic book part, the narrative isn't actually that bad. It's, it basically creates a corporate structure to multiple afterlives, hell, hell, heaven, nirvana, and a bunch of stuff that hasn't revealed to us yet are all kind of competing for a workforce consisting of, you know, dead souls. Pretty simple concept, right? So simple that we didn't need to fucking do homework before we read it. We're introduced this world's concept through the character of Jack Dursey, who basically just acts like a douchebag until John Cena shows up and murders his family. Once he's been extra stabified, Jack becomes our plot MacGuffin. He's the filter through which we see this new world. And while the story itself is interesting, it's fine, there are some problems with that filter. And that's Brimstone and the Border Hound's biggest problem is just in the execution of its ideas. Whether it's the opus that it opens with or just the execution of the art. Like, there's just so many distracting miscues in how it is drawn. Like, I'm not exactly sure why this cop car is more chody than the other ones. There are some panels where the poses and movement are super dynamic and other that are super wooden, relying a lot on wide profiles because every time the art is asked to have perspective, things get wonky and bulgy and potato-like. And at one point, Jack turns into Steven Tyler for some reason. Yes, uh, the art is wonky. And the fundamental parts of sequential storytelling can occasionally miss fire, but Conceptually, there's something really fucking charming about this book. It is just so flamboyant and fearless. There's a very nostalgic 90s quality to it where everything is kind of silly and overdone and just extra pulpy. This is very much grindhouse entertainment, whether it's Hell's reggae DJ or the butthole ripping out ground arms and this panel, which is something else really. It's comic book junk food. I mean, look at this, look, look at this panel. Look how big that bazooka is. That's, that's fucking awesome. From what I've shown you, from what I told you, you can very much tell what this book is. It's not great literature. Fucking John Steinbeck don't work here, yo. Is this a great book? No, 
Fuck no, absolutely not. It's a million miles away from being a great book. Did I like it more than some big published books? Like, fucking Run, Love, Kill? Shit, yeah, I like this more than Run, Love, Kill. Of, of the eight million books they sent me, I don't know how many more will actually show up on the show. If it's interesting and I want to talk about it, I will. So look for more of these coming in the future, or not. I don't know. Fuck it. What do you want from me? Now, the idea of the symbol of Batman and what Batman stands for has kind of been done to death at this point. Yes, the bat symbol is it's an instrument of fear and it's an instrument of healing and it's a symbol of vengeance and justice and nocturnal flying mammals, whatever. But the idea of what Robin might mean has always kind of been overshadowed. To me, Robin is almost a more relatable character. I mean, the healing process of Batman has been so hyper-focused and kind of unachievable to the everyman. It's, uh, yes, we all have bad things that happen to us. Yes, we all have trauma. And no, none of us can end up becoming Batman in the end. But we all can kind of relate to Robin, because while Batman has been a figure of you know, healing and vengeance and justice, Robin's always been more of a character of purpose. We can all relate to the feeling of being an adolescent person just starting to understand injustice and unfairness and all those things and wanting to search for purpose and wanting to search for some, you know, a way to turn our angst and, and agency into good. So the idea that Robin would inspire the youth of a city or a nation to take up arms and to find purpose themselves is cool and immediately sellable. And that's what we are Robin is. It's a group of kids that are going to be Robins together because they think it's rad and they think it's a cause to get behind. We Are Robin is a book about a bunch of youths that are drawn together by a mysterious figure to kind of form this pack of vigilantes. All these kids have some various level of trauma and a desire for purpose in their lives. And the concepts of We Are Robin and So Can You are brilliant and simple and fucking endlessly expansive in their possibilities. It's a book that centers around the Batman legend but separates itself enough from it that it can be its own story. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, yet again, we have a book that is not quite up to the weight of its own ideas. The execution of this book falls flat in several ways. Conversations feel extremely edited to the point that they are overly purposeful. It basically just exists to fire plot directly in your face, like a literary bukkake. Yes, we get it. Robin is supposed to be a young person, and young persons are millennials now. And millennials talk like millennials, and they reference social media, and Justin Bieber in, in 27, so I really don't know what adolescent people talk about. Rock'em Sock'em Robots, Game Boys, and Butterscotch. Anyway, the mannerisms and references used by these adolescent characters don't quite come off as genuine. And when you read the dialogue of these characters, they end up sounding like parents who are trying to seem cool to their kids' friends. And you can never really quite buy it, because the execution is always just that little bit off. So this book cannot quite be connected. You see that hashtag two after the title? This is still an early book. And But when it comes to early on in comic book series, We Are Robin is strong in the area is that count. And there's still plenty of fucking time for them to correct the execution and pacing issues. And if this book could just take some time and settle down and catch his breath and maybe, you know, enjoy a sip of some of this fine borderline poison. If given a chance to grow, this book would end up being something really worth keeping an eye on. Man, Infinite Loop is really starting to wear me out. I've never seen a book that vacillated in quality so drastically from issue to issue. The first issue was actually one of my favorite single issues of any book this year was drawn. The character was unique, she had a lot of personality. And then the next two issues happened and the quality fell off the goddamn Hoover Dam. And here we are, arriving at issue four. And the fucking like the series again, what the hell is going on? Now that the story has transformed into like a quest for vengeance mixed with a coming of age tale, it becomes again, so freaking interesting. Teddy is lashing out, pulling apart the very fabric of the entire universe in a quest to find vengeance for what she lost in the last issue. And in doing so, she is hurtled back into her own history, viewing her life from outside of herself. And the idea of looking back at yourself completely unburdened from your own perspective and kind of seeing your own actions and the actions of the people you love um, unbiasedly is a really cool idea. And the book 
makes the most of it. I criticize this book for being overly adolescent before, having characters that are driven by nothing but their heart and their genitals. And now view and now viewed and now viewed through the filter now viewed well, the drunk mouth has shown up. And now viewed through the filter of issue four, the childish and impulsive actions of issue two and three gain new meaning. Hetty just doesn't look back and see the mistakes of her past. She goes back and experiences them again with all the gained life experience and perspective of an older person. She witnesses her own maturity and, and because of that, she's able to see her own lack of maturity in her present form. It's awesome and deep and the fulfillment of the potential promised us in issue one. The excellent parts of issue four do not excuse the flaws of issue two through three. And the series is beginning to feel really inconsistent. This is gonna be one of those series that you just can't judge until it's over. And we see exactly what the point of this whole goddamn thing was. Pulled these already? Yeah, it was kind of a slow week. Those were really the only books that were worth talking about in any details. So let's go over the rest. Sons of the Devil number three. I have no idea what is going on in Sons of the Devil. And that might be the best thing about it. It's a book about a man who grew up orphan trying to find his family and and what he finds instead is this horrific devil cult thing. It had a really unimpressive first issue but it has grown into something really interesting and definitely worth getting on to now. Imagine if your little brother was Jason Momoa. That is birthright. It continues to be one of the best contemporary pieces of fantasy out there. It's written by one of comic books rising star, Joshua Williamson. There's a lot of momentum and good things going on behind this book. And it's a book that is criminally underread. The first trade is already out. It is my recommendation for this week. Make sure you guys hop on Birthright because it's, it's morphing into one of the underappreciated gems of the industry. My guilty pleasure in comic books is Weird World. It's written by one of my favorite writer, Jason Aaron. It has some of the most gorgeous artwork out there. Big fantasy fun. It feels like when you're a little kid and you're playing with action figures in multiple different sets, there's endless imagination, endless amounts of fun. Make sure you guys check it out. Old Man Logan is really embracing the um, Clint Eastwood, Kane wandering the world sort of mentality to it. This old man Logan character is sort of wandering every different part of battle world and getting into shenanigans. It sort of has that Mad Max quality where Mad Max always kind of just shows up in other people's stories and kind of watches them happen. It embraces the anthology spirit of Secret Wars and it's probably my favorite Bendis work in a long time. Star Wars Kanan or Kanan, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say it. I'm a bad Star Wars fan. I apologize. I'm really not that sorry. This book is probably the best prequel trilogy era story out there. Evidently this book stars with one of the characters from the Star Wars Rebels Disney show that I don't watch, but I assume is good. 10 thumbs up. But I do know that the comic book is good. The book seems desperately in the need of something to spice it up because it's beginning to feel familiar issue to issue. Last book, all new Hawkeye. Jeff Lemire is doing his best to try to make this book his own. He's following up Matt Fraction, which is kind of mission impossible. But when he's focusing on Clint and Barney's upbringing, the book starts to develop its own feel, its own style. However, when he spends time in the present day, things just feel too familiar. Oh. The garbage water I drank during the intro is tearing apart my stomach. Blast through this outro and get this mess over with. I need this. Thank you so much for supporting this channel and uh, for watching this show. I remind you all to please follow us on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. Is there any books I didn't talk about this week? Any books that I'm not reading or that I'm missing repeatedly on this show? Make sure you leave them in the comments below. Also, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. If every new subscriber we get this week, I will be too drunk to think of a joke. Um, if I have a new subscriber we get this week, I will travel back in time once and kill the John Connor. Did I use that joke before? That sounds like one I would have used before. Anyway, before I turn into an even bigger, drunk, sloppy mess, make sure you come back next Sunday and every Sunday that I have time for more comic book world news. Wow. <laughs> That's a sh that, I haven't said that in a long time. That's a show that doesn't exist anymore. My bad. Make sure you come back next Sunday and every Sunday till I have time for more. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> make sure you come back next Sunday and every Sunday until the end of time for a new episode of The Pull, which is this show that I do now. Now, just get the fuck out of here and go read comics.